Okay, I, I wait for uh, one or two minutes because now the participants are coming in. Okay, so welcome back everybody. And I'm very excited to uh, announce our next speaker, Ashwin Vishnawat from Harvard University. He uh, is uh, very famous in, for his work in the field of uh, topological and collective phenomena and uh, made also major contributions uh, especially theoretical to twisted graphene, especially when graphene turned out to be interesting for the for the community of, of collective phenomena. It's also very nice to see how, how twisted graphene has uh, brought together people from different communities. So um, we're very happy to, to have you here, Ashwin, and um, we'll do the same thing as we did with the last talk. So please type your questions in the Q&A box and Ashwin will try to answer them during the talk. So the floor or the screen is yours. Thanks, Frank. Uh, and thanks to all the organizers of this, um, uh, this summer school and workshop. Um, so I have very good memories of uh, visiting uh, Barcelona and uh, ICFO in particular, uh, a couple of years back. Um, and uh, in fact, that was, um, I think, one of the first times that I uh, gave a talk on magic angle graphene that we had you know, begun to work on. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of nice discussions and feedback. Um, uh, and I was looking forward to visiting ICFO again, but uh, I guess this will, uh, this will have to do a uh, virtual visit. So, um, uh, let me tell you about um, our latest uh, thinking about this uh, this problem, um, and we think we've made some um, some interesting progress. Uh, and these are my collaborators. Um, uh, it's with Islam Talaf at, and Shang Liu at uh, Harvard, and uh, we had this uh, wonderful collaboration with uh, Mike uh, Zalatel's group at Berkeley, uh, uh, Shubayu and uh, and Nick. Uh, so we have two papers on the archive. That's mainly what I'll talk about. Um, and um, uh, the, the topic, of course, is uh, magic angle graphene. Um, and I'll try to uh, ex describe a theory um, which uh, we believe can explain both the, uh, the ordered phases, the insulating phases that are seen, um, uh, as well as the superconductivity. And uh, there's kind of an interesting uh, relation or um, a connection uh, between the two of them. Okay. All right. So uh, you know, since uh, uh, I first got into this field, uh, the thing that is um, the question that has been um, sort of important uh, that I've kind of worried about was, uh, you know, you, you have these nearly flat bands of magic angle graphene, where we know that electrons, you know, interact strongly. Um, so how do we model this uh, interaction? Um, and there are actually two um, ways in which we have approached correlated electrons. Typically, when you see a problem like this, uh, your first reaction would be to try to find a lattice model, something like a Hubbard model with some hopping, with some interactions that are local in space. Of course, that uh, assumes that you can find Vanier functions that uh, we'd like them to preserve all symmetries. And early on, we, we knew that uh, this was not possible. You need to extend uh, either give up on symmetries or extend uh, uh, the Hubbard model to include more uh, than just the minimal number of bands. Uh, that's certainly one approach. Um, uh, but the approach I'll talk about today, that at least recently we have had more progress uh, pushing forward, uh, is kind of a complementary approach. Um, this is kind of the approach that you take when you're talking about the quantum Hall effect. Uh, you work directly in the continuum. In the case of the quantum Hall effect, it's the Landau levels. Um, you work directly with the Landau level wave functions, uh, and then you add interactions uh, on that problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, to give you a, a sort of a, a preview of what's gonna come, 
uh, we're going to try and take that same approach for magic angle graphene. Okay, and we'll see that uh, unlike the quantum hall problem, of course, you've not broken time reversal symmetry over here. Uh, it cannot be that you have just a single Landau level. Uh, it will turn out the basic building blocks, uh, blocks of this uh, magic angle bands are a pair of um, uh, a pair of bands, which are number one and minus one. Um, and if you like, it's a, a Landau level and you know the opposite uh, uh, Landau level together. Uh, and when viewed in this basis, or uh, from this point of view, um, you get a lot of mileage and um, uh, you can think about the effect of interactions um, and how they can lead to the you know, very interesting experimental observations. Okay, so that's kind of a, a overall uh, view. Uh, but let me give you a more detailed uh, kind of overview of what I'm gonna cover. Uh, so the first thing I'll talk about is uh, a little bit of the single particle physics. Uh, motivating this uh, picture, this Landau level uh, picture. Um, and that will set the stage to add electron-electron interactions. Uh, and we'll see that uh, at the end of the day, the physics is uh, uh, rather similar to uh, ferromagnets, quantum hall ferromagnets. Uh, but we'll have to think about some generalized ferromagnets, not just the spin. Uh, and uh, you know, usually the way we treat these kind of problems is by deriving a sigma model. And we'll indeed see that there is such a sigma model we can, we can write down. Um, and uh, when the sigma model orders, um, that corresponds to the, uh, the insulator that people first observed. Um, we believe uh, uh, corresponds to this, uh, uh, these insulators. Um, and uh, so that'll be the first part A um, of adding interactions. Um, the second part uh, is maybe somewhat unexpected. Um, when we you know, try to uh, think about disordering the sigma model, quantum fluctuations disordering it, uh, in fact, it turns out that that ends up giving you uh, a route to superconductivity, uh, even in a system which has strong uh, Coulomb interactions. Okay, so that was something of a bit of a surprise, and that's what I'll try to get to towards the end of the talk. Um, and eventually, I'll try to have some discussion, um, you know, trying to connect things uh, to, uh, to some of the recent uh, experiments. Okay, but uh, let's see how far I go. Okay, so first let's talk about the single particle uh, picture. Okay, I assume there were no questions so far. I don't quite have my chat open, um, but I hope there will there'll be no questions. Uh, I guess Frank will alert me if there are any questions. I just the Q&A box is sufficient. You don't need to have the chat open. The Q&A box, uh, okay. <laughs> I can try to do that, but... Uh, um, I may have to get out of my, uh, just give me a second. Okay, no, no open questions, good. Otherwise I'll remind you, so. There you go, all right. Okay, so, um, so we all know that there is this magic angle when you have this pair of sheets of graphene twisted relative to one another. Um, and uh, the, this one degree magic angle, where does that come from? Uh, of course, there are these detailed uh, calculations, uh, but one way to think about this problem is that there is this dimensionless uh, ratio, if you like, the ratio of the tunneling strength between the layers, and uh, if you like, the Fermi energy uh, of graphene scaled by the relative angle. That's kind of the, uh, the, the energy you compare to. So there's a very physical way of thinking about this ratio uh, it's the time to traverse um, uh, for an electron to, to go from one Mori lattice site to another, uh, it, uh, the ratio of that time to the time it takes to tunnel between the sheets, okay, which of course is set by the inverse of this energy scale that couples the two layers. Um, and when this is of order one, it turns out the angle that corresponds to that is roughly one degree. Uh, that's when we expect significant uh, reconstruction or change of the band structure. It doesn't quite tell you that there's going to be a flat band, uh, but it does tell you that something is going to happen. Okay, and uh, when you solve this problem, I'll, I'll describe it in a little more detail, but let's just take a quick look at the energy scales. Uh, you get these uh, very low energy bands that have, uh, these low energy bands that have very small dispersion, um, and uh, they are separated by a gap to the other bands, and, um, uh, in the graphene, um, and uh, there's also an interaction scale that sort of exceeds that bandwidth, and that's why you're in a, uh, 
a strongly correlated uh, regime. Okay, so there's uh, somewhat of a tendency to focus a lot on the energy scales. Of course, they are important, uh, but maybe one of the main points in the talk is that in addition to these uh, energies that uh, people talk about, there are these wave functions, the wave functions of the flat bands that uh, play a very important role. And um, uh, you know, that's something that I'll talk about in more detail uh, during the first part of this talk. Okay, so uh, just to set some notation, uh, we have these pair of sheets of graphene twisted, uh, giving rise to this Mori uh, lattice. Um, and in momentum space, that corresponds to this mini Brillouin zone, um, much smaller than the original Brillouin zone. And because of that, um, you know, the small angle limit, you also have uh, this value that ends up being conserved, uh, which value appeared from in the original, uh, more, uh, in the original graphene Brillouin zone. Okay, so if you just stare at this problem, and uh, this, is, this was my first thought, that you have this lattice, um, you know, you have spin degeneracy, of course, factor of two, you also have valley degeneracy, that gives you a factor of four degeneracy. Um, so you would have these mini bands, and you could fill four electrons at every one of these sites, and that would correspond to filling a band. So roughly speaking, you would have a band that looks something like that uh, in the Moray uh, Brillois zone, this tiny uh, blue Brillois zone. And filling that would correspond to filling uh, and getting a band insulator. Okay, so um, somewhat surprisingly, um, uh, this turns out not to be the case for magic angle graphene. Okay, it turns out uh, this is sort of true for many of the other Mori systems, uh, but at least for magic angle graphene, it turns out actually the bands that are closest to charge neutrality, you need eight electrons to fill them. Okay, and that's because you get a pair of bands, you can call them valence and conduction, uh, they have to touch. Um, and this touching point uh, gives you this doubling of um, uh, you know, the number of degrees of freedom uh, that appear in this problem. So if you like, there's an additional degree of freedom, you can call it the band uh, degree of freedom, and you really need eight electrons to go from being completely empty to being completely full. Okay, and this extra degree of freedom is gonna play an important role in the theory. Uh, it's gonna end up giving you an additional uh, degree of freedom called pseudo spin, uh, and eventually this, um, uh, sigma model we're going to write down is for the uh, ordering of these pseudo spins. Okay, so um, uh, so with that in mind, with this um, uh, kind of picture in mind, let's uh, quickly look at the experiments. Uh, of course, you've heard uh, heard this in more detail in the other talks um, that this was the original uh, report of superconductivity, um, and this was at a filling of what I'll call nu equal to two. Um, so you have this nearly flat band chemical potential right in the middle is charge neutrality, completely full and completely empty. Uh, these we'll call uh, a filling of plus four and minus four, and you're somewhere halfway um, filling these bands uh, uh, halfway between these two points. Okay, that was where these, the original report of the insulating phase and uh, the nearby superconductors um, uh, came out of uh, Pablo's group at MIT. Um, and, um, you know, an important thing is that uh, in addition to very low resistivity in the superconducting phase, they also saw these uh, Fraunhofer uh, diffraction patterns with applying a very weak magnetic field, um, uh, Fraunhofer pattern in the critical current, uh, which is sort of a very strong signature of phase coherence. Okay. Um, and of course, since then, um, uh, there have been many other studies confirming this uh, that are interesting. Uh, experiments from um, uh, Dima's group at uh, ICFO. Uh, here's a picture of that. They also have these correlated insulators. Um, and you can see the entire spread over here from nu equal to minus four to plus four band insulators. This is charge neutrality, and these are nu equal to two and minus two, for example. And that's where these insulators are seen. Uh, later experiments where the interactions were weaker. Uh, these insulators were melted into metallic states. Uh, we may talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, but uh, we'd like to understand what is the origin of these insulating phases and the superconductivity that is, uh, yeah, that is seen in the system. Okay, so... Um, um, <clears throat> in case you're yeah. using a cursor uh, or a mouse, we, we don't see it. So oh, I'm sorry. We, I'm, we... I'm sorry. No, I said, yeah, I have two screens. Sorry, thanks for pointing it out. Uh, Actually, let me continue. You, can you still see my mouse? You can, I guess, right? Um, uh, wait, now, now I don't see it. Can you move it? Yes, I can see it now, yes. Okay. All right, uh, I'll have to somehow um, 
All right, so, um, so let me just remind you about this, uh, the symmetries of twisted bilayer graphene. Um, uh, so at small angles, which is where we are gonna be interested in this problem, um, there's a, a number of emergent symmetries, even if you don't precisely stack your uh, layers together in a particular fashion. Uh, for example, commensurate versus incommensurate is not uh, relevant. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the disparity in the, the length scales is so much uh, between the graphene scale and the Murray scale uh, that you really cannot measure if something is uh, commensurate or an incommensurate uh, Murray crystal. Okay, so um, similarly, you have an enlarged symmetry, the C6, um, uh, which is, um, you know, you can see it in this microscopic kind of picture, um, but you would also have it in this, where although microscopically, you didn't try to impose C6 symmetry. Um, uh, most of these, uh, uh, it's very hard to tell that these different Moray uh, unit cells are slightly different uh, on rotation. Okay, so it will turn out the part of the symmetry uh, that's going to be very important is, um, you know, the C2, the 180 degree rotation. Again, that's something rather unique to this uh, magic angle graphene. And we'll see that that's responsible for certain degeneracies and um, uh, things that are uh, critical to our theory. Okay, so um, uh, uh, so the, the two symmetries that I'm going to uh, invoke uh, frequently are the valley symmetry, the valley conservation, uh, and this uh, C2 symmetry. Okay, and we heard about uh, the topology of these flat bands. There's a, a nice review yesterday in Andre's talk. Um, and, you know, one of the consequences is that if you want to preserve all these symmetries and just write on a model for uh, the, the nearly flat bands, uh, there's an obstruction to doing that. So either you have to enlarge the number of bands or you have to uh, break some of the symmetries. Okay, but we won't really be going in that route. Uh, we'll sort of work directly uh, in the continuum. Okay, so um, again, a very brief review of the continuum model, uh, which is used to derive these uh, band structures. Uh, so you have these two layers, these two sheets, the up and down sheet of graphene. Um, and you have direct fermions in each of them. Those are these, um, uh, these diagonal entries. And there's a tunneling term, which is what gives you all of this magic that tells you that uh, there are these two sheets coupled together. Okay. And um, um, when you put this together and uh, derive the band structure at this particular magic angle, you get these very flat bands. Okay, but if you look carefully at this band structure, uh, you know, the other bands come extremely close in energy uh, to this flat band. Okay, and uh, we said, you know, both experimentally um, and to have these isolated bands, um, uh, you know, th there should be a physical mechanism to get rid of these other bands or move them away in energy. Uh, and in fact, in early days, it was identified um, that um, if you look at this hopping matrix, it has two parameters. There's a hopping between opposite sublattices, the so-called W1, uh, and hopping between the same sublattice of graphene. Yeah, and a priori, there's no reason for them to be uh, equal. That's what you would have if you had perfectly rigid uh, sheets. Uh, but if you allow the sheets to relax, uh, they end up enhancing the W1 relative to the W, W0. Okay, so um, uh, the band structure I showed you before was having setting these two parameters to be equal. Uh, but if you say the tunneling in these so-called AA regions, where the, uh, the atoms in the two sheets are almost on top of each other, um, compared to the tunneling in this so-called AB region, uh, which looks like Bernal stack graphene. Um, so the AB region is energetically preferred, you know, because it looks like Bernal stack graphene, um, whereas this is energetically um, disfavored. Um, so uh, a combination of uh, physical processes, including uh, mechanical relaxation, gives you stronger hopping in this AB region compared to AA. Okay, so um, uh, that ratio turns out to be something like 75% um, reduction. Um, and when you put this in, you get, uh, you know, again, this flat band remains, it doesn't destroy that, uh, but the other bands uh, move away and there is an isolated set of flat bands. Okay, so this relaxation is important. Okay, so one um, uh, you know, theoretical device that we have found extremely useful, at least to begin with, uh, in thinking about this problem, uh, is to ask what happens if I uh, completely switch off this AA hopping. So I have a, a model which, like the original graphene, only features A to B sublattice hopping. Okay, so we call that the tidal model. Uh, switch off these uh, same sublattice hopping terms 
uh, and ask what happens. Okay, so it turns out in that limit, you have uh, a chiral symmetry, which is, turns out to be very powerful. Uh, this chiral symmetry tells you that there's an operator that anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian. Or more physically, because you only have hopping between A and B sides, if I give you an energy eigenstate that um, uh, you know, has some energy E, I take that eigenstate, I flip all the signs of the, let's say the B sublattice uh, wave function components, uh, you're gonna get a, a state with energy minus E. Okay, that's, um, uh, that's what the sublattice symmetry is saying. And you can see this is the chiral model. Uh, at this level, it's not uh, easy to tell that this band is even more flat. Um, they're already pretty flat to begin with, uh, but you can kind of tell that this, this tiny bit of dispersion is also gone, uh, and these band gaps have increased. Okay, so there are many things one could say about this chiral model. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll use it as a starting point to think about the problem, and always we'll try to add back uh, uh, you know, the perturbations that take us back to the realistic uh, problem. Okay, but it, it gives us a, a good starting point. Um, so there, uh, let me very briefly mention a couple of nice things about this chiral model. Uh, some of them I actually won't use, uh, but some of them I will use. Okay, so one thing uh, that's nice about the chiral model is when you write it in this form, uh, you know, it only has uh, off diagonal entries because only A to B sublattice uh, matrix elements. And um, this uh, entry is actually a two by two matrix. Uh, and if you stare at it, the derivatives that appear over here are just the analytic uh, derivatives. Okay, so it ends up having this flavor of a quantum Hall problem because uh, it turns out the wave functions they're gonna get at the end of the day are just analytic functions of X plus I1. Okay, and um, one way to get uh, a flat band is to demand zero energy states for this two by two matrix. So you end up solving a simpler problem than you know, finding the spectrum of this four by four. Uh, this is a trick that people often use uh, uh, in these uh, kind of draft models. Uh, and it turns out it's quite easy to solve this problem if you tune uh, to this particular magic angles uh, at which these solutions exist. Okay, so it gives you an analytic way, if you like, uh, of finding the wave functions of these, um, uh, you know, at these magic angles, which is, uh, you know, at least for a theorist, that's, uh, uh, that's kind of useful. Yeah, and it also gives you some insight into these wave functions. Like I mentioned, it looks a lot like uh, the quantum Hall wave functions. Uh, it has some arbitrary analytic function over here um, that you can multiply by just like uh, with uh, lambda levels. So you'll see that it's not just the topology that uh, I mentioned before that's similar to these uh, pair of lambda levels. Uh, it's also the geometry of the bands. They, they have a, a close connection to lambda levels and that's important if you uh, want to think about energetics, okay? So you really need uh, not just the total Berry curve which integrates to something, but also the Berry curve which is relatively uniform and, uh, and other criteria like that. Okay, but this is really a, a, a topic for a different talk. Um, um, and, uh, but, but the part of these, uh, these wave functions, the, the aspect that I'll use, as you can see in the solution, uh, we only have wave functions on the A sub lattice that are appearing, okay? So, uh, you can take the, the wave functions of this uh, chiral model. Um, they have the structure that I said. Um, if you have an energy E wave function, you can make an energy minus E wave function by just changing the sign, uh, the relative sign of the uh, one of the sublattice components. Okay, now it also means that you can, instead of working in this band basis, uh, you can go to a different basis. You can decide to take um, uh, the, um, you know, uh, the bonding and anti-bonding combinations over here, and you can end up getting pure sublattice wave functions. Okay, so, um, so that's what you have over here. We've uh, gone through that process. Uh, the kinetic energy is not diagonalized over here, but, you know, given that kinetic energy is, a sp is relatively small, um, you can take this liberty. You know, if this wave function is better for the energetics, uh, this may actually be the right set of variables uh, to think about the problem. Ah, there's a question. Um, yeah, can you think about flat bands of chiral model with the, within a path and type of language in terms of uh, interference? Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know how to do that. I suspect those words are true, but uh, I don't know how to give you a derivation that explicitly does that, but that could be an interesting problem. Uh, we know a few things about the chiral model, but maybe I can talk to you later. There, there are certain conditions under which you get the flat band. Uh, 
uh, which are, there are of course some symmetry constraints, but um, uh, there are some other uh, weird conditions that we don't quite understand why they have to be there to get the perfectly flat bands. Uh, various people have raised their hand. Um, Frank, do you want to uh, handle that in some way? Yes, I will allow to speak the person to speak. Um, I, sorry, I don't see who raised the hand. I don't see a hand raised. Okay, maybe they removed it. I just saw the hands being raised and then they went away. So. Okay. Let if me just person proceed. raising their hand still wants to raise it again, please. Okay, continue then. Okay, so um, uh, so the key part over here is, uh, you know, once you go to the sublattice spaces, um, no surprise you can do this because of the chiral wave functions. Uh, what you find is that uh, those bands actually carry a churn number. Okay, so the A sublattice bands carry churn number one, and the B sublattice bands carry churn number minus one. Um, and so this is this aspect of this physics is what we're going to use. There's a, a connection. Uh, between uh, the churn number of the band and which sublattice uh, they live on. This is kind of familiar to us from graphene quantum Hall effect. Put a magnetic field on graphene, the zeroth lambda level is entirely on one sublattice in one particular valley. Uh, the interesting thing is this happens without a magnetic field over here. Okay, and uh, these wave functions are rather like um, the quantum Hall wave functions um, uh, in addition to having this uh, churn number. Okay, this polarization is complete. Um, when you're in the chiral model, as we move, move away, um, you still have a finite polarization. And that will be sufficient for us uh, to retain the essential physics of this, uh, of this chiral model. Okay, so once I rearrange the bands in this way, I have the, I have, this is what my band structure looks like. Forget about the dispersion. Um, I have two valleys. In each valley, I have a pair of bands. They can be labeled either with the churn number, plus one, minus one, or with the sublattice. Okay, and the two are tied uh, to one another. Okay, so that's the picture that I'm, I'm going to utilize. And you can see there's a web of symmetries that connects these different levels. So in fact, if I had no dispersion whatsoever, uh, these different levels would be, this, this pair would be related by time reversal. This pair would be related by C2T, combination of 180 degree rotation and time reversal. Um, and uh, you know, similarly, this and that would be related by um, just a uh, C2 rotation. Okay, so uh, these things are all tied together because of these symmetries, uh, and uh, this degeneracy is going to be important uh, as we go along. Okay, so just as a, you know, uh, something that we can uh, think about, uh, let's say we add a sub lattice polarization to break this 180 degree rotation. Okay, so A and B are no longer identical. Uh, that's going to split these two bands. Okay, so uh, I can, for example, think of an HPN substrate that is aligned. So the A and the B sites now have chemically uh, distinct uh, atoms, so they're going to give you a splitting. Um, and these levels are going to separate from one another. The A, the, let's say the B gets pulled below the A. Okay, and in this picture, you can ask what happens. Uh, so it's going to look like this. Once you release the symmetry, um, you have the B sub lattice that's below. And if you further assume that you are at one quarter filling, so only one of these uh, two bands is, uh, is occupied, you spontaneously pick one, uh, you expect to get a churn insulator. You completely fill this band, it has a particular churn number. Uh, and in fact, that is what was seen in these uh, very nice uh, papers by uh, the Stanford group and um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, UC, the UC Santa Barbara group as well, uh, where they saw this um, uh, quantized anomalous Hall effect. Uh, appearing in the squat of filled um, HPN aligned uh, graphene. Okay, so that's kind of a, a sanity check. This picture can, when you lower the symmetry, it can give you these um, uh, kind of uh, phenomena. Um, but the question now is what if we do not lower the symmetry? We actually have uh, rotation symmetry and we have to deal with this degeneracy. Okay, so that brings us to the, the, uh, the first part, which is. Um, you know, how do you get an insulator when you have it, when you're at some uh, filling, um, uh, you know, that is not the, the fully empty or fully filled bands. Uh, and we're going to focus on even integer filling. It will become clear as we go along why. Uh, so what I mean by that is either charge neutrality, uh, zero or uh, plus minus two. Uh, 
Okay, so we're going to think about that. Um, um, and the problem we really want to solve uh, has, uh, you know, is this red star over here. Uh, it has some finite deviation from the chiral limit. It has this AA hopping. It has some band dispersion, not a lot, but some band dispersion. Uh, but the approach we're going to take is we're going to start with an idealized uh, model, which has this chiral symmetry. It also, we're going to throw away uh, the band dispersion. Um, and then we're going to put these others as perturbations. Okay, so the nice thing, um, what you gain by doing this is, it turns out you can solve this problem exactly, okay, at least, um, um, you know, with, uh, uh, with one or two assumptions, you can find the ground state in that limit. Uh, so that gives you a lot more confidence um, about, um, you know, what you're doing. Uh, and then you can add these perturbations. And the hope is that those perturbations, we'll see there's some degeneracy to begin with. Um, those perturbations are going to lift the degeneracy. Uh, and the hope is that they will lift it in such a way that they don't conflict with one another. So if they lift uh, the degeneracy in, in, a, in a consistent way, um, then you can end up, you can be fairly confident about the ground state you get uh, when you actually go to the, the realistic uh, set of parameters. Okay, so that's the strategy, but let's start by talking about this ideal uh, limit. Um, and let me try to give you some intuition why you can actually solve this uh, ideal uh, higher symmetry limit. Um, so you've thrown away the dispersion. So really all we have in the problem is Coulomb interactions. We have repulsive interactions uh, between the electrons. Um, and you, know, you have to fill some fraction of these, uh, of these levels, these flat, uh, these flat bands. Um, and as you can see over here, I've written them out in kind of gory detail uh, at, for every K point. For one value, that is, uh, there are these two churn sectors we talked about. Um, and of course, you also have the spin degree of freedom up and down and the two values. So all in all, you have eight levels uh, corresponding you know, the, to the eight electrons that you need to completely fill these bands. But you're at some partial filling. Let's say you're at charge neutrality or you're at B equal to plus or minus two. Uh, which subset do you pick? Yeah, and in fact, the subset is not just uh, you know, picking uh, levels over here. You can also make linear combinations of levels. Um, and uh, you'd like to understand um, you know, how you do these linear combinations. You could have more complicated states as well, but I'll argue in a minute, it's really these, uh, these kind of states, these generalized ferromagnets that are gonna be the ground states, at least in this idealized uh, limit. Okay, so uh, the special thing that allows you to, to do this, to make progress is the fact that these uh, different bands, they live on different uh, sub-lattices and different uh, values, okay, values and spins. So if you decompose the density, we just have density, density interactions. Uh, if you were to decompose the density, uh, it decomposes into a set of independent terms. Okay, so you have the density of, of electrons in this band plus and density in that band and so on. Um, and because of this, you have some enhanced uh, symmetry. Okay, so you have, you can make any rotation of the electrons uh, within these uh, energy levels. You can make any rotation within these energy levels. Um, and uh, those rotations are going to be a symmetry of the problem uh, in this idealized uh, limit. Okay, so it's got a, a hidden symmetry, uh, which is substantial, which is fairly large. Um, but this higher symmetry model, you can solve uh, exactly. Okay, so, um, so we have a generalized ferromagnet problem. Uh, and uh, how do you fill these up? So just as an aside, without getting too many details, this is uh, consistent with these very nice experiments. Uh, by Shahal and Ali uh, Asdani, where they see this kind of a cascade uh, picture. You fill uh, different levels, uh, and this is sort of the, um, uh, you know, uh, the degenerate levels over here, um, you know, have, have a similar flavor when you think about uh, ferromagnets, uh, a generalized ferromagnet in this basis. Okay, so one more uh, word about interactions. Uh, so you have these Coulomb interactions, which we just said is a density density interaction. Um, and um, uh, these density operators, we want to just consider the action within the flat bands. Okay, later we'll have a more expanded um, you know, picture, including the other nearby bands. But to begin with, imagine we just project all the interactions. And here is where the wave functions of these levels become important. When you do that projection, you get a form factor in the density. That is essentially the convolution of the wave functions of these, uh, of these band electrons. Okay? And uh, uh, that's, where, that's why the band uh, 
the band structure wave functions plays a key role uh, in this problem. In particular, if you have uh, bands that are sublattice polarized, uh, that's going to decouple this uh, density into different components that don't talk to each other. Okay, so, um, so one uh, simplification that I'd like to do is, um, you know, instead of working with these four bands uh, for each uh, churn sector, I want to uh, get rid of spin. Okay, I want to ignore the spin uh, and reduce the problem to just two bands. So you'll see this has the essential aspects uh, of, the, uh, of the problem. If you like, you can think of this as a spinless model. This is spinless graphene. Um, but it also turns out to be the model for um, the filling of nuclear two. Okay, so when you get to nuclear two, um, halfway between charge neutrality and complete filling, uh, you polarize the spin. And uh, so you can essentially forget about one, um, you know, one flavor of spin. Uh, and the remaining flavor is where the action is. Um, and you can, uh, we're gonna focus on those two uh, in, this, uh, in this pair of levels. Yeah, so there's a question, are the basis functions um, uh, theta functions? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, there's an overall envelope that is a bit more complicated than lowest band or level wave functions, but uh, there's a piece that is a theta function if you work in the band basis in the crystal momentum, if you label states by crystal momentum. Of course, that's only for the, the chiral limit uh, extreme flat band, right? the perfect flat band. Um, but the, um, uh, the aspect that I'm using over here is not so much the fact that they are specific theta functions, uh, but that they are sublattice polarized. Okay, they all live on one sublattice, um, and that holds true even away from the flat band limit. Hope that answered the question. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so this is the problem I ultimately want to think about. Um, I have these two levels uh, in each churn sector, um, and I want to fill them with electrons. Uh, I have, uh, you know, in this language, four levels and two electrons. And the question is, how do I, how do I fill it? Uh, what are the different states that I can get? Um, and, you know, uh, in this idealized limit, many of these states are going to be degenerate. I'd like to go away from the idealized limit later and, uh, you know, find the subset that is eventually selected. Uh, there's a question about nu equal to two. Um, is it spin or value polarized? That's a good question. Um, and Oscar has a similar question. Let me get back to it later, uh, both those questions when I talk about the experiments. Um, actually, for me, when I say spin, I just mean one of those degrees of freedom is gone. Um, and we'll come back to this question of whether it is um, uh, spin, uh, what is the nature of the order parameter for nu equal to two? So I know maybe we should dismiss it and talk, uh, maybe you could raise it at the end and we'll discuss the, uh, the picture for uh, an equal to two. Um, so here I wanna think about this, um, uh, just the set of two levels uh, in each John sector. All right, so, um, so let's just to familiarize ourselves with this uh, Hilbert space, let's think of some simple ways in which we can fill uh, these levels, half fill them. Um, and uh, so one thing I could do, for example, is... Um, uh, Ashwin, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Marco Polini has a question. Marco, you can speak now. Marco? I think he's muted. Does someone have to unmute him? Uh, Hey, sorry, no, 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 I just did a mistake, sorry. So you have no question? No, no questions so far, <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, good. All right, so now let's... Um... Okay, so, so we want to fill, um, you know, fill this um, uh, halfway, and um, you know, what you can show, maybe this is a bit more for the theorists, uh, you can show that these kind of ferromagnetic states where you completely fill these bands um, are actually exact ground states uh, for this interaction Hamiltonian. Okay, and it, uh, that comes about because this VQ is um, positive semi-definite and you can show that these states are annihilated by the density operators. If this, a state like this, for example, um, so a state like this uh, is annihilated by the density operators, 
because if you act with a density operator, you end up uh, violating the poly exclusion principle. Okay, so, um, so once you do that, you know for sure this is a zero energy state of a positive semi-definite Hamiltonian, so you're guaranteed it's one of the ground states. Okay, so, um, so let's look at the space of these type of generalized uh, ferromagnets. There are many states, but not every state is a generalized ferromagnet, so it, it still has some, uh, it, it makes some distinction between the different states. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> uh, here's a simple uh, pair of states where, uh, uh, you know, we can call this one, um, uh, you know, take one uh, particular valley and completely fill it with electrons, say the K valley. Uh, so that's the valley polarized state. Um, and if I uh, have a spin representation for it, these are actually pseudo spins, not to be confused with the real spin. Uh, this two-level system is pointing up, and this two-level system over here in the opposite churn sector is also pointing up. Uh, so this is like a, a pseudo-spin ferromagnet where both of these pseudo-spins are uh, parallel to one another. Uh, there's another one where they could be anti-parallel. They're both pointing up, but they're in opposite directions. Um, so in this one, you fill one of the valleys with, um, uh, you know, uh, in churn number one, you fill... Um, uh, you know, the, the K valley and, um, uh, you know, you fill the time reversed um, uh, state in the uh, opposite churn sector and the opposite valley. Okay, so this is a state that respects time reversal symmetry, um, but uh, in the pseudospin language, it's up and down. It's also one of these generalized uh, ferromagnets. We'll call that uh, valley hall. Okay, so this was the state actually that got picked out when you apply an HBN uh, sublattice potential that favors if all the electrons on the A sublattice or B sublattice, for example. Now, there's no reason why the pseudospin had to be in, along the Z direction. It could be in the XY plane. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, that means that you make linear combinations between the K and K prime values. Okay, so you can make the, uh, this linear combination over here, for example, which means the pseudospin is in plane. And if you think about symmetries, this is really a state that breaks translation symmetry. It combines two states that are that have opposite uh, valleys, uh, opposite uh, corners of the graphene Brillouin zone. Uh, so it breaks translation symmetry at the graphene lattice scale. Okay, so that's going to be important. It's not the Moray scale; it's at this much shorter atomic graphene lattice scale. Uh, so what do these states look like? We'll call them intervalley coherent states because they have some fixed phase difference between the two valleys. Um, so here's one where you have the same linear combination occupied in both churn sectors. The two pseudospins are parallel, but they're in the plane. Um, and here's another one. This is going to be our kind of our um, favorite state. Uh, we call it the KIVC, the Kramer's intervalley coherent state. You'll see why, why Kramer's in a little bit. Uh, here you have one pseudospin along the, uh, you know, pointing in this direction, the other one pointing opposite, but both are in the plane. Okay, so you... Uh, you fill the, let's say, the plus combination over here and the minus combination over here. Okay, so when you do this, you allow, we'll see later, you're going to allow for tunneling between these two. Uh, and there's some weak uh, interaction, like a super exchange that is going to favor the state. Okay, so, um, uh, so let's, let's talk just a little bit more about these intervalley quorum states. So there's a question. Yeah, so from quantum Hall physics, we know that SU4 symmetry breaking Coulomb interactions are important in selecting ground state. Yeah, so you'll see that, in fact, even before you get to those symmetry, um, sorry, let me read out the question. Uh, can you comment on this about selecting, about breaking of SU4? So yeah, we're gonna talk about breaking of SU4. Uh, and this uh, SU4, this uh, large symmetry is in this ideal limit. So when we put the perturbations to get back to the uh, realistic problem, we're gonna break down the symmetry. Okay, so let me just have one more slide on intervalley coherent states uh, with the actual, uh, the form of these, uh, these wave function, uh, these uh, order parameters. So there's a valley index tau, let's say, and a, a sub lattice index sigma. So AB is sigma Z is plus or minus one, tau Z plus or minus one is, is the valley. Uh, you can think of different intervalley coherent states, basically different charge density waves or density waves that appear on the, um, on the graphene scale. Uh, and make it into like a three sublattice um, symmetry breaking. Uh, so one is just the simple charge density wave where you have just scattering between the two valleys, tau x and tau y. Uh, 
it turns out this is not one of our generalized ferromagnets. Um, so even though we have a large family of states, the simple charge density wave is not there. It's energetically bad, as you can imagine. Um, what you do have instead are these two states I talked about where the pseudo spins are either parallel or anti-parallel, the T, what we call the time of TIVC and the KIVC. Um, and these are really, if you think about it, it's really the hopping that is modulated on the scale of the graphene lattice. So sigma X takes you from one sub lattice to the next, it's the hopping matrix element uh, on the graphene scale. And that is being modulated in a three sub lattice fashion in this particular order and in this one as well. The distinction between these, this is like a, the strength of hopping is modulated. Over here, uh, the phase of the hopping is gonna be modulated. Okay. All right, so, so which one is actually picked out when we lower the symmetry? Uh, let's lower the symmetry in two steps. Uh, first, let's try to put back the band dispersion. Okay. So what, what's gonna be picked out? Uh, so here, there's a very simple physical way of understanding what is picked out. Uh, you, want, you want states that are uh, antiferromagnetic between the two churn sectors. Okay, and the reason you want it is exactly the same reason why you get antiferromagnetic coupling in, say, in, in, uh, in a spin a half Hubbard model. Uh, you want to, uh, you know, you have the hopping that relates these two states. If the hopping is weak, you can do a T squared over U perturbation uh, expansion, uh, and you can end up getting a super, something like a super exchange, a J. And this really wants the two spins to be antiparallel. If they're antiparallel, there's no blockade and you can do this virtual uh, process. Okay, so roughly speaking, this J is of order one milli electron volt, so like of order 10, 10 Kelvin. And um, you know, if you want to take away one energy scale from this theory, this is really the interesting low energy scale that comes out. There's an antiferromagnetic coupling between the pseudo spins. Uh, we'll see later, it sets a lot of these physical parameters um, uh, uh, for this problem. Okay, so that's easy to figure out what happens when you put, put on the dispersion, pick pseudospin states that are antiferromagnetically aligned in the two churn sectors. Okay, and this is just uh, reminiscent of the super exchange. We'll sometimes call it uh, super exchange and we're gonna use J over here as well. Uh, but, you know, the physics is somewhat different because we're talking not in real space, but in these, uh, you know, the pseudospin uh, flat band space. Okay, so now which of our states actually satisfies this condition? Well, we talked about them. One is when the pseudospin is along the z-axis, that's the uh, so-called valley hall state. Um, and the other one is this inter-valley uh, coherent state, but the, the Kramer's version of it, the KIVC, where uh, the pseudospins are antiferromagnetically uh, aligned, okay? Uh, so these are good as far as, they're actually equally good at this uh, level. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, SU2 symmetry that rotates these different states into one another. Okay, but that was only one of the perturbations. Uh, we now have to add the other one, which is uh, we have to move, uh, you know, go away from the scattered limit. So we know there is some hopping in the, uh, from the A to the A regions. Uh, we need to put that uh, back in. Um, and I won't go through the details of how that resolves the degeneracy. Um, but essentially what happens is that there is a different uh, U2 get, that's, get, that gets retained. And again, you get a pair of states uh, that are favored uh, when you move away from this carbon limit. Okay, and these turn out to be the valley polarized. Um, you know, this is uh, where uh, the electrons just sit in one valley. Uh, but the nice thing is that the other set of states that is equally favored, which are all related by this new, by this different U2, uh, is this Kramer's IVC. Okay, so what we see is that if you put both perturbations together, there's a unique state that's picked out, uh, that, and that is this uh, Kramer's IVC. So the prediction from this kind of analytic uh, theory um, is that if you start from the ideal limit and you know, put in a, a perturbation of, that goes toward these, uh, towards the, the realistic problem, uh, this large ground state of the ferromagnetic uh, problem uh, acquires some anisotropies and eventually you, you fall into this uh, Kramer's intervalley coherent state. Okay, so that's as far as the theory goes, but you may worry about various things. One thing you may worry about is we didn't retain the further away bands, we just kept the, the flat bands. Um, this is also has some flavor of, uh, you know, putting in perturbations. Um, <clears throat> the actual uh, values of these parameters are not that small. Um, uh, they're, uh, you know, they could change things. So we wanted to check this uh, and we ran this uh, Hartree-Fock uh, theory. Um, 
So the Sartre file keeps some remote bands. Um, uh, it also puts in this finite strength of perturbations. We also allow for some states that are not actually part of this degenerate manifold, like this, the semi-metallic state where you don't actually open a gap. Okay, so all of these are retained. Um, and uh, every time we have done this Hartree fork, we have found the ground state is always the same. It's this uh, famous intervalley Kronen state. Okay, so you can see over here, uh, this is as a function of adding different remote, different numbers of these remote bands. Um, so not just the flat band, you keep the remote bands um, and you calculate the ground state energy. Uh, you calculate the energy of these various states um, and always the ground state is this Kramer's IBC. Uh, there's something interesting that happens in the excited state. Some of these uh, change order as you change the number of bands. For example, eventually the next uh, lowest state is the valley hall, this green one over here. Um, and then the, the one slightly above it is the valley polarized. We also have the semi-metallic state appearing. So these uh, energy splittings are not being trusted, important for us. Uh, we'll see later to get parameters of our sigma model. Okay, but the, the model of the story was that even if you do these different, uh, have allow for these more realistic perturbations, um, you end up with the Kramer's uh, IVC state. Uh, and uh, your band structure within this simple picture um, is, uh, you know, you go from the set of bands that is nearly at charge neutrality. Uh, this is without any order. This is the, um, before you add the interactions. Uh, you add the interactions and you end up getting this, uh, this gap. Um, and uh, this is consistent, of course, with an insulator. Um, and uh, uh, in this particular problem, this gap minimum is at the gamma point. So you could imagine if the interactions are weaker, if you lower the interactions, sometimes you get a gap, but it's not a complete gap. You get you know, Fermi pockets, you get electron and hole pockets. Uh, so this could uh, you know, be relevant for situations where you don't see an insulator, uh, but you see a lot of the other phenomena uh, associated uh, nearby. Um, so there'll be two different issues, whether you have order and whether you have the insulating behavior. Uh, the insulator is kind of a proxy for the order. If you have an insulator, you know it's ordered in one of these uh, channels, or it's very likely. Um, but you may have the order without opening a complete gap. And that's something it's important to keep in mind. Okay, so um, uh, so let me just have a, uh, say a few words about this uh, Kramer's IVC. What, what is the state, right? Um, so we found this order parameter that looks like this. Um, uh, some modulation of the hopping on the graphene scale. Okay, so it breaks translation symmetry, it breaks the lattice translation. Uh, but again, because of the separation of scales, uh, this breaking of lattice translation is, turns out to be uh, like a, uh, a continuous symmetry breaking because we have this valley symmetry that is, that's essentially a U1 that is spontaneously broken. So you would expect to see goldstone modes, um, uh, low energy um, goldstone modes coming from this um, breaking of symmetry. Okay, there's another point that is kind of interesting, which is uh, whether it breaks time reversal. Okay, so we just stared at this, it, involves uh, currents um, and um, you know, because you modulate the phase of the hopping, you get currents within the graphene unit itself. So the current is circulating in one direction over here, opposite direction there. Uh, this is sort of a cartoon sketch of what this uh, order looks like. So obviously you, you break time reversal in this uh, process, um, but if you look at it from a coarse scale where you have the, the uh, valley symmetry, uh, you can restore time reversal by uh, you know, making an additional uh, valley of phase rotation. Okay, you can define another operator, which is T prime, uh, rotate in the valley space and combine it with the complex contribution with the time reversal. Okay, and it turns out this combined operation is uh, a symmetry of this Kramer's IVC. Okay, and um, one thing you can check is that if you square the symmetry, this uh, new time reversal, uh, it squares to minus one. So it's like a, a Kramer's like time reversal uh, that is present um, uh, in the state. That's why we call it the Kramer's uh, IVC. Okay, so if you think about it, this state, once you break uh, symmetry, go down into this low energy manifold, um, this manifold has the same uh, symmetries as a topological insulator. It's got some Kramer's like time reversal. Uh, instead of spin orbit, you're using the valley as a spin like degree of freedom. Um, and there's some combination of uh, operations here that gives you a Kramer's uh, time reversal. Um, and this squares to minus one, uh, and there's a charge conservation. So you can ask, what is the Z2 topology of this, uh, of this problem? Um, and in fact, it's easy to see that it actually has a non-trivial uh, Z2 topology. So a non-trivial Kane-Mele kind of uh, index. 
um, essentially because you have a pair of churn bands that are related by time reverse symmetry. Okay, there's a question, just a second. Um, good, yeah, this looks like loop current. Yeah, I'll comment, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have uh, um, this reference to these other papers that, uh, let me get to that in a second. Okay, so one question about Z2 topology is whether it has edge states. Um, uh, so because this T prime requires some value rotation, it requires value symmetry, uh, there's some aspect of uh, crystalline symmetry being invoked. Uh, so you need a relatively smooth edge for the gapless edge states. Um, so that's an interesting question whether the way it's prepared right now, whether you'd have edge states or not. Um, that that uh, goes back to the question of how are you going to try to probe the state? So if this is indeed uh, the ordered phase we have, it's a very subtle kind of ordered phase where there are currents in the ground state, but uh, there's no net magnetization. The magnetization uh, cancels out. Um, uh, and uh, this is what it looks like on, uh, in the Moray unit cell. Uh, the actual currents are significant. They're like uh, half a microamp, um, uh, but uh, they are varying on this tiny atomic scale. So it's a kind of a challenge for experimentalists. How do you see this uh, order? Its main impact, of course, is on the fermions. You have a gap for the fermions. Um, so indeed, it's like the, uh, it has some resemblance to these other um, um, uh, states that, uh, you know, have broken time reversal symmetry via these um, circulating currents. There are two differences. One is this is, um, this has a goldstone mode. It's kind of freely floating. It's not locked into the lattice, uh, whereas these uh, don't have that kind of decoupling between the lattice and the, um, between the lattice scale and the scale at which this um, uh, you know, scale at which this order is forming, um, and also this has the Z two topology, and I don't think there are others which have this kind of Z two topology that uh, uh, that appear. So there are some uh, uh, similarities, but there are some differences because of the uh, the small angle uh, essentially that appears in this problem. Okay, so all of that can be now summarized into, uh, you know, a sigma model. So we said that we had these two um, um, you know, pseudo spins for the two churn sectors. They can be, for example, up or down or any direction on the sphere. Um, so we have a, a model that has some stiffness for these two sectors, uh, rho. Uh, and then there's some antiferromagnetic coupling between them. And also there is some anisotropy. Okay, so, um, you know, we were used to writing these kind of phenomenological theories, but in this particular case, you can actually calculate all of these parameters. So we know the sigma model pretty well. Um, so the splitting, for example, between the different states in this uh, Hartree-Fock numerics gives you these uh, couplings over here, lambda and j. Um, and you can use this table to fit those, uh, those splittings. Okay, so the ordered phase of the sigma model is simply the insulator. So when you order the pseudo spins, you get a particular order, you get a gap to the fermions, uh, those are the insulators. Um, with this uh, caveat that you could have Fermi pockets that end up making it metallic. Um, but if you see an insulator, it's uh, probably associated with this order, in particular this KIVC uh, order, at least according to this theory. Uh, but the interesting question is what happens if uh, I have quantum fluctuations that tend to disorder these spins? <coughs> Uh, so I have a fluctuating sigma model. What do I get? Uh, normally, when this happens, you know, you have you just get some paramagnet in this uh, pseudospin paramagnet. Um, uh, it's just some ordering and you know disordering transition that you can think about. Uh, but in this particular case, because of the topology of these bands, um, the fluctuations of these spins are actually related to the electric charge. Okay, so in fact, when you disorder the sigma model, you'll see that you get a superconductor. Okay, so these um, it, it's kind of like the physics of the quantum spin all effect. Uh, the spin physics and the charge physics are sort of uh, tied together. Okay, so, so that's really the, the second part of this, um, uh, technical part of this talk. Actually, how am I doing on time? Um, I think I have another. Um, you, uh, so basically, we have 15 more minutes, but that includes questions. So. Okay, yeah, let's see how, let, let me try to, uh, you know, say a little bit about the superconductivity because that's what people may be most interested in. Um, yeah, so the thing is we don't have a program after that, so we're not super strict with time. So, right. continue, we also have questions during the talk, so. 
cover this part. Uh, for okay, sure. yeah. All right, thanks, Frank. Okay, so, um, uh, so that is really from this paper that um, on the archive. Um, so the key observation is the following. Say I, I pick one of these churn sectors and I have the pseudospin in that churn sector. Uh, and imagine that I make a skirmion texture of that pseudospin. Okay, so it looks like this. Um, we've kind of had a bias for the texture for the in-plane orientation of the pseudospin because we like this KIVC. Um, uh, but anyway, this is a skirmion. And uh, the fact that the skirmion is occurring in this particular set of bands which carry a net churn number uh, implies that the skirmion will carry electric charge. Okay, so this is a, a result that's known since uh, the days of the quantum Hall effect. When you have a quantum Hall ferromagnet, um, you form a skirmion of the spins uh, that is electrically charged. Okay, so that is the first uh, kind of observation. Uh, we have the exact same setup over here. We have a pseudo spin. We have this degenerate pair of levels where uh, you have some freedom to, uh, to form textures. Um, and when you do that, uh, it, it uh, kind of binds uh, electric charge. Okay, and one way to think about it is uh, an electron moving around the skirmion will see a, a, a Berry's phase because the pseudospin is rotating. The Berry's phase is like uh, the Arnaud Bohm effect of a magnetic field, but we know the magnetic field in a churn band uh, will attract electric charge. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so the question is the following. There are, now we have two different routes to making a charge carry. One is to do it in the usual way. We have these gap bands. Uh, we go and add an electron band. That's one way to make a, uh, you know, charge excitation. Uh, but now we have a new, uh, a new way uh, using this texture. So we can uh, live in this model that uh, is described by my sigma model. I just tell you how the pseudo spin is rotating around in space and time. Uh, I can make a texture of that pseudospin so that it binds electric charge. Okay, and the question is, are these like, uh, you know, which one is a better way of introducing charge? For example, energetically, which one is better? Um, you know, for example, it could be that the skirmion way of doing it is extremely expensive and it's never going to be relevant. Um, and uh, so that, that's the important thing to check. So there's one limit where, in fact, it's known that uh, the skirmion is very competitive. Uh, in fact, not only is it competitive, it's actually lower energy than this way of making a charge X station. Uh, and that's in the, in the limit of uh, Landau levels in the quantum Hall effect, right? So this is uh, old work uh, where you can show that if you're at new equal to one uh, in the quantum Hall effect, magnetic field, uh, total filling of one, but there's a spin degeneracy. You have a, a spin ferromagnet, uh, but you make skirmions of that spin. Uh, that's a way to make electric charge one. Uh, and it has lower energy uh, than you know, putting an electron into the opposite spin band, into this band over here. In fact, it has half the energy. And experiments kind of confirm that every time you put in an electron, uh, it looks like many spins, many more spins are overturned than you would expect by just putting one electron in a downspin band. Okay, so there's experimental evidence in the quantum model effect. The question is in our problem, does this uh, happen or not? Yeah, and we'll be quite satisfied if the skirmion is fairly low energy. It doesn't necessarily have to be the lowest energy station. If it's within, uh, it's comparable to the band gap, that's already uh, puts it into play in this, uh, in this problem. Okay, so, um, so there are two things that you could imagine doing. One is simply to make a skirmion in one of these, um, uh, you know, one of these uh, sort of spin sectors that attract a charge of uh, E. Uh, but we know that there's actually an antiferromagnetic coupling between these two sectors. There is this uh, J uh, that likes to align the pseudo spins between the two sectors. Um, so when you make a skirmion over here, if you have a uniform uh, profile of the, of the other spin, of the other pseudo spin, uh, that is going to cost you energy. It's like a Zeeman field being applied on this uh, texture. What is much better is to also make a skirmion over here. In fact, if you want to satisfy this antiferromagnetic coupling, skirmion here should go with the anti-skirmion in the opposite churn sector. Okay, but if you add that up, uh, if you have a skirmion in one and uh, anti-skirmion in the other churn sector, uh, it turns out they both carry the same electric charge. Okay, so you invert the sign twice, you get the same charge in both, uh, both of these sectors. And actually what you end up with, this, uh, this bound object uh, where the pseudo spins are anti-parallel at every point, uh, this object carries charge uh, 2E. In fact, it's the Cooper pair in disguise, right? It's uh, with the same symmetric quantum numbers as the Cooper pairs, uh, 
except that it can be relatively large because these fermions could be big. Um, and this gives you a way, a mechanism, if you like, to make pairs, even if you have uh, repulsive interactions. And you can compare the energy of this uh, to making a pair of electrons in these bands. So that's really the, the comparison. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so this is uh, reminiscent of other uh, you know, earlier proposals of Sturmion superconductivity. Uh, in different models, they don't quite look like this, um, but uh, they have these essential features. Uh, the one thing that's new and different over here is that we want to work with the actual Coulomb repulsion because we're we trying to propose it as a mechanism for the system where the dominant uh, interactions are repulsive. Uh, and in fact, that's the, the um, uh, you know, answer by this picture over here that uh, you could mitigate Coulomb repulsion while having this, uh, this pairing if you make these fermions uh, you know, relatively big. All right, so, um, uh, so let, let's do a comparison of the energy. So what is the energy of this fermion? Um, well, you, you can get that from the sigma model. You need to figure out what is the, uh, the stiffness uh, of the sigma model. Uh, and from that, you can calculate the energy of the skirmion. It's eight pi times the uh, stiffness. Uh, and you can compare that to the uh, particle hole gap. Okay, that will tell you which is, uh, whether the skirmion is competitive at all uh, with just making re regular uh, excitations. Uh, both of these quantities are set by the Coulomb scale. So it's really, uh, uh, it's, uh, the ratio is some number that you have to figure out. Uh, so that ratio is shown over here. Uh, above this gray line, the skirmion is more expensive. Uh, below the gray line, it's less expensive than making uh, just electrons. Um, and you see that in the chiral model, of course, or as you approach the chiral model, uh, skirmions are very cheap. And um, uh, they approach the quantum Hall limit of one half. Uh, but when you go towards the realistic uh, parameter values, uh, they're comparable. It's kind of hard to tell from this, um, but they're both of, uh, you know, you, you constantly throw away the skirmions. They're also there. Sometimes they're below, sometimes they're slightly above. Um, and they will play a role uh, in this problem. Okay, the, the full discussion, you, you have to look at this paper, there are anisotropies we have uh, neglected, the, the full picture is a little more uh, complicated, uh, but this is uh, the essential uh, point that we need to think about skirmions as well. Okay, so this, we have a picture of a pairing. Uh, pairing is not quite superconductivity, you also need uh, a superfluid stiffness uh, to get uh, the superconductivity. You could have pairs that are just you know, localized, um, so, so you want to check what the superfluid stiffness is. Uh, so that is really uh, connected to the inertial mass of these excitations. Okay, so if I were to, you know, push them and give them some momentum, uh, what is the energy that I pick up? Um, and uh, there's a trick for figuring out the inertial mass of these kind of objects that obey Magnus dynamics because they are like, uh, you know, these uh, spin objects. Um, you, you kind of separate them by some scale uh, in real space that translates into a momentum and you just have to look at the restoring force, kind of a spring constant in order to figure out the effective mass. Okay, and uh, again, it turns out the scale that sets this is, uh, is J. Yeah, the super exchange scale. So the effective mass of these uh, charge two objects uh, is one over J. So the larger the J is, uh, the smaller the effective mass and therefore the higher the condensation temperature, for example, the, the TC is uh, essentially the inverse of this, um, uh, of this mass, the superconducting TC. Okay, so this, um, uh, you know, there's some analogy with vortex rings. I won't have time to talk about it, but it's something familiar from the quantum Hall effect of how to get the inertial uh, mass of these, uh, of these vortex-like uh, objects. Okay, so, so all of this is kind of pictures and words, but uh, can you actually do a calculation uh, that shows this? Um, and of course, what we need to do is we need to uh, you know, calculate um, using the sigma model uh, and, and see whether the, uh, the disordered phase, uh, you know, if it uh, appears, uh, what is the, the superfluid stiffness? That's what we'd really like to, to calculate. Okay, so uh, the sigma model over here is written in terms of this field, which is the, have an enforced the antiferromagnetic constraint. Um, so N is just the uh, antiferromagnetic vector. There's a stiffness, there's also a time component. So this is the kind of the, uh, <coughs> um, uh, it's like a susceptibility. Uh, so one important technical point is it has a second time derivative action, unlike quantum Hall ferromagnet. So quantum Hall ferromagnet is broken time reversal. You cannot really disorder the ferromagnet uh, quantum mechanically. Uh, but here you can because it's an anti-ferromagnetic um, uh, coupling. Uh, so wait, there's another question. 
uh, what is the lens scale in real space? Um, okay, so that's a bit of a tricky question. Um, so if you look at, um, uh, that's really set by the anisotropies, which I've uh, you know, kind of left out. Uh, maybe if I have time at the end, I'll come back to what is the lens scale of the skirmions. Um, but uh, you, know, you have to be a little careful when you're thinking about a finite density of skirmions. Um, that's why we like this field theory calculation of the sigma model because it, you don't have to actually picture a skirmion of a certain size uh, that is trying to condense. Uh, it's, uh, it's sort of incorporated in this, uh, in this particular uh, model. Okay, so the, the way in which the uh, this topological aspect of the sigma model appears uh, is really through this connection that uh, if I look at the skirmion density, uh, it's actually related to the electric charge. Uh, so normal sigma models, you know, normal antiferromagnets do not have any connection like that. Uh, so for example, if you apply a chemical potential to the sigma model, usually you take a spin model, apply chemical potential, it doesn't really care. Right? Uh, but here, the, uh, the chemical potential will uh, like to introduce skirmions okay, because that's what carries the charge. And there's also a Coulomb interaction, a repulsion between the, the skirmions, which is because they carry electric charge. So this is a problem uh, you can solve with the Coulomb interaction with predominantly repulsive interactions. Um, and um, uh, you, know, you can try to ask, does it have a superfluid phase? And if so, what is the stiffness? Okay, so, um, uh, so the way you technically do this, I'll kind of skip over it, is you, you map it to what's called a CP1 theory, um, which has an emergent gauge field, which uh, you know, gives you the skirmion density. Uh, and you can solve this within some large N approximation. Um, let me just skip through this. Uh, let me just go to the result. Um, and what you find is that as a function of chemical potential, um, you can, for example, calculate the superfluid stiffness. So here's a cut for a particular, uh, this is really the, uh, the stiffness of the, uh, the sigma model we had before. You pick some point over here and you take a cut in chemical potential. Um, so initially there's a gap, of course, there's a gap to charge extations. Once you close that gap, um, there's a superfluid density, you begin to pick up some superfluid density. Uh, and this is roughly consistent with what you would expect uh, it's set by the scale J uh, times the filling. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, at least within this approximation, uh, this model seems to have a superfluid phase. Okay, here's a question. How do we put a magnetic field into the pseudospin sigma model? That's a good question. So uh, if you have a vertical magnetic field, uh, it turns out the first thing you do is to shift the two churn sectors relative to one another. So there's like an orbital G factor that shifts the two uh, turn sectors. Okay, another question. Can you remind us how J depends on the parameters of the initial? Oh, that's a very good question. I'll come to that. Um, yeah, so roughly speaking, it is T squared over U, uh, but we'll, it's an interesting question to ask, how does it change with interactions? Yeah, so I have a slide on that. Okay, so here's the conclusion for my theory part. Uh, and the main takeaway is that, uh, you know, this magic angle graphene, because of the geometry and the, the topology of its flat bands, it allows you to write down a theory which can talk both about the order in the insulating state and the superconductivity at the same time. Okay, so uh, it's certainly one, uh, you know, way to think about this problem. Whether this is what is actually realized in the experiments is, uh, you know, like an open question we need to have predictions to check, uh, you know, what would this picture give you? Um, but there is this theoretical option, and in the hope is that nature has kind of taken that, uh, taken that option. Yeah, and the other takeaway point is that there is this key uh, parameter J. If you want to make this uh, superconductivity stronger, you want to make J larger within this picture. Okay, so it gives you a route to make a better superconductor. Uh, back to the question that was there: How does J depend on the microscopic parameters? Okay, so if I can have one or two more, um, uh, show one or two more slides. Um, so we said that this J is T squared over, over U or T squared over V, right? Roughly a millivolt. Um, let's say I interact, increase interactions. So naively we would say that J is going to decrease okay, because V is not denominated. But it turns out in this problem, uh, most of the dispersion is also generated by interactions. 
So T is also proportional to the interaction strength, the Coulomb interactions. Uh, you know, if you, for example, were to vary the screening, uh, you would actually find that the stronger interactions has larger T and larger V. So in fact, they both increase uh, with interactions, J increases with interactions. So there's a calculation here. Uh, you know, I told you this way in which you can extract these parameters for the Sigma model. If you change the screening length in the Hartree fork, uh, so changing the, making the screening length longer is like increasing the strength of the interactions. Then you see that uh, the, the value of J you get actually increases. It goes from like half a millivolt to uh, one millivolt at these longer uh, straining lengths. Okay, so it seems to suggest that if you have stronger interactions, you'll get a higher TC. Um, so, okay, everything else being the same, right? We don't change anything else. Um, there's some evidence for this. Again, uh, you should take all of this comparison with a grain of salt. There's a nice experiment uh, where they managed to change the screening. Um, uh, by uh, you know this, uh, you know by putting in this um, uh, a screening layer that whose you know the screening property they can change, and if you increase the, the strength of screening, uh, TC actually drops, which is consistent with what we we had. It's a relatively small drop. Uh, there's a much bigger drop in the, the gap later, which is also what you'd expect. The, the weaker interaction, smaller gap. Okay, so. Um, so that's one comparison with experiment. Uh, there's another question about the size of the Sturmian. Yeah, let me get back to that. Um, uh, okay, so, so one thing that you can, you know, from this picture, you can do various things. You can, um, you know, try to compare with the existing experiments and so on. Uh, but one thing you could do is, you know, this is telling, forget about magic angle graphene for a second. Uh, you know, maybe this is telling you a different way to get superconductivity. There are a list of uh, ingredients that are, uh, that are uh, required. Um, so the ingredients are you have these two churn bands. So a pseudo spin, each churn band is degenerate, has some pseudo spin degree of freedom, and there are a pair of them, the sequel to one and sequel to minus one, related by time reversal. And then you need J, you need some tunneling between them. These are the ingredients that give you uh, this mechanism. You can ask, are there other systems that have this ingredient? If so, you know, go and look at them because they may be uh, good places to look. Um, so one thing you can show is some places where they don't have this ingredient. For example, uh, imagine that I break this A to B, the C2 symmetry, okay, like we did with putting it on this HPN substrate. Aligned HPN, you break this uh, A to B symmetry. Let's see which of the ingredients we still have. Okay, so you can imagine you have spin in each of these churn bands. So you still have some degenerate pseudo spin or spin. They're related by time reversal, you have that still. But the thing that's missing is there's no J. There's no way to tunnel from this valley to the other. <clears throat> so you would expect from this list of criteria, you miss one criterion for this particular setup. So you don't expect to get superconductivity, at least from this mechanism uh, in this setup. Okay, where C2 is broken because of the aligned HBM. Okay, so one way you can try to fix this, I don't know if it is experimentally possible, but you know, have a substrate that allows you tunneling between valleys, something that breaks translation symmetry. It may be weakly, but allows some sort of tunneling. Maybe this could be converted uh, into a superconductor. Uh, okay, so um, I, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Oscar has raised his hand, so we'll allow him to talk. Yeah. Uh, Oscar, was it an accident? Also, Paco has his hands up. Okay. Paco, well, they get, well, they're unmuting. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, that is can, okay. can you hear me? Can you, yeah. can you hear me? You can hear well, me both, actually. Sorry, I, it, it takes a, there's a little delay uh, when uh, you allow me to unmute. It takes about 30 seconds before I'm able to unmute. Um, um, Ashwin, um, if you could go back to this experiment, I have a comment about it that may be very important. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an update on that experiment. It uh, turns out that the effect is actually opposite uh, oh, really? when the low pass. Yeah, when the low pass filtering is included, uh -huh. um, the 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 TC of the superconductor goes down as you strengthen the Coulomb interaction while the uh, insulator 
the correlated insulator does get stronger when the Coulomb interaction gets stronger. Aha, uh -huh. so it's, it's like the opposite of the strand over there. Um, exactly, it's the opposite of what you're showing for the superconductor. Okay, I, I wish I had known that. <laughs> but yeah, that, you know. Um, yeah, the paper is on the archive. The updated paper is on the archive. Oh, really? Okay, okay, maybe I have yeah. a version, yeah. So, you know, that is, that's not what we would expect from this J. Of course, I should say that, you know, you're holding everything else fixed when you think of just J changing, um, which may or may not be true for this, uh, for this problem. Right? Uh, other things could change with J. Okay, and there's also a question or comment from Paco. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, the, the, away from half filling, even the bands of the of the chiral model at the magic angle become dispersive because you have the electrostatic potential. Can you yes. comment on that? Yes. So you know we include the dispersion. Um, so maybe I should go back. Uh, that is one of the um, you know one of the perturbations that we had. Uh, Um, so this band dispersion we add, and you know, as you said, most of it comes from interactions, um, right. and you know that actually that is what gives you an anisotropy that picks these states which are antiferromagnetic in the pseudospin. Yeah, so that is um, you know that's a relevant kind of um, uh, anisotropy that you have to include. Uh, so that puts you into this manifold. Um, where you have these pseudospins that are antiferromagnetic clear line. So this coupling over here is the, uh, is the kinetic energy that you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, just get to my last slide over here, um, which is, you know, what are the other platforms you could think about? Um, um, yeah, so we said you could have this charge density wave giving you uh, tunneling. There's another, um, you know, maybe less well-known um, configuration where you preserve C2, which is these uh, sandwiches with alternating twists that uh, we had a paper with uh, 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 last year. Um, and it turns out these have wave functions very similar to magic angle graphene. And they, in fact, they have the C2 symmetry. Uh, and one of the nice things is they have larger magic angles. So this is square root two. Uh, if you have two of them, you have the, the golden mean, um, which is if you have four of these uh, layers. So larger magic angles, of course, are better because the interactions are stronger, at least within our picture where interactions help everything. Um, uh, you know, this is uh, another system which has the C2 symmetric. The one fly in the ointment, if you like, is that, for example, tri-layer case, you also have, in addition to the nearly flat bands, you have these drug points as well. So that's something that you need to, uh, need to include. Okay, so this is my last slide, I think. Um, many open questions. Uh, like, you know, one thing we have wondered about is how do you detect the order we talked about? Um, you know, are there other samples? Uh, this, there's something uh, unusual about the experimental observations of charge neutrality versus nuclear two. Um, you know, within our theory, if you have a um, insulator at nuclear two, you should also expect one at charge neutrality. It's, it's kind of hard for us to imagine how uh, it doesn't work in that direction. Um, you may have Fermi pockets along with these, um, you know, along with the Sigma model, we uh, need to figure out a way to, uh, to include that theoretically. Okay, so it's clear this field is going to be under construction uh, for some time, hopefully not as long as uh, this one, but, uh, you know, hopefully you'll see the, um, you know, see the end soon, but, um, uh, many interesting directions uh, that are still left. Okay, so now maybe I'll, I'll uh, take some questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this uh, fantastic overview, um, as well as insights in the state of the art, as theoretical insights. So there is time now for some questions. We are a bit late in time, but uh, let's take a few questions. So, so I remember Oscar had this question about spin. Let, let me actually get to that. Um, so what is the spin structure for, for um, yeah. So, so what is our picture for the spin? So our picture is roughly this. Um, 
So we have, um, so we are at nuclear two, um, and this is, you know, um, these are the filled bands. So this is a chemical potential. Um, so you, you can kind of come up with this picture from uh, these, uh, this flavor polarization experiments uh, that you first spin, you, you fill one of the bands, say the spin down, uh, and then you have this KIVC in the remaining uh, spin band, let's say the spin up. Um, and then if you look at the uh, effective uh, low energy physics, it's gonna be this pair of bands. Okay, so one caveat I should say when I talk about spin, uh, it could of course be the regular spin, the, uh, you know, say spin up in both the valleys. Uh, but in principle, I'm allowed to make uh, SU2 spin rotation on just one value. Okay, so this uh, spin is this, uh, you know, allowing for the and the flavor that I call spin. So hopefully that answers Oscar's question. I think there are more questions if you scroll down. Uh, yes, okay, so, um, okay, how large is the size of the scamion? Um, okay, so this is a, a slightly hard to answer without knowing the, um, uh, the anisotropies in the problem. Um, so this is something that happens in the quantum Hall effect as well. If you have no Zeeman effect, uh, the skirmion is actually as big as the size of the system. Um, but with the Zeeman effect, there is some finite size that you get by uh, optimizing these things. Uh, so this is of order the Moray scale or a few Moray scales, uh, depending on what this anisotropy is. Um, but I'm not sure you need to think about the size of the skirmion when you're in the condensed phase. So of course, if you put in one skirmion, you can talk about how big it is, but once you have a finite density of them and they're condensed, uh, it's not clear to me that size is uh, physically relevant. Okay, there's another question. How will symmetry in uh, TBLG, example C2, uh, affect superconductivity within this model? I think I just talked about that. Um, and uh, a summary question, just as doping pushes pseudo gap to superconducting phase in cuprates, uh, do you have a similar picture in mind when doping away from nuclear to two pushes IVC to superconducting phase mediated by skirmion pairing? Um, yeah, so roughly the picture is you start the IVC, you add in charge, uh, and at least some of the charge goes in as skirmions and gives you a superconductor. Uh, it's actually possible for that superconductor to coexist with the IVC. Uh, you could have both orders at the same time. Uh, so unlike a vortex, a skirmion doesn't destroy the order, uh, except in some region around the core. Uh, yeah, so that is uh, roughly the, the, the simple-minded picture. Um, so this, I think that's the same question. Um, yeah. All right, so I think these questions are all answered there. Right? Good. Anybody that wants to raise hand? Oh, more coming. There's a question from... See you. Okay. All right. So you mentioned this model is unique to twisted bilayography. Can we understand this is why superconductivity is only clearly seen in this system and on other twisted systems? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I mean, if you take superconductivity as being the ob uh, observation of these interference. Of uh, these um, kind of Josephson um, interference kind of uh, fringes, then I think that's the only one where it's been seen. Um, so this may be a way to, that is consistent with this picture. I have a question about the insulating state of charge neutrality point. So uh, is there any theoretical insight that this may be more sensitive to twist angle variations than the insulating state at hull filling? That's a good question. I don't see a priori why. We can try to do that calculation and see if that is true. Uh, it would be a surprise uh, for me. Why, why, why a char charge neutrality that would be more sensitive uh, I can think of many things where nuclear two is more sensitive than charge neutrality. 
Yeah. Uh, the other way around is a bit of a puzzle for me. And yeah, maybe other people have ideas, but it's, uh, um, yeah, it, it, it's you, you, the charge neutrality is like the mother state and everything else is uh, kind of the daughter states. That's how you would naturally, um, you know, that's how you would set it up. But um, yeah, I don't know. Good question. It could have to do with these remote bands. The remote bands are more important for the uh, higher filling states. Again, I would have thought that would make them weaker insulators, but maybe there is some effect where the remote bands actually give you a stronger insulator, if the two rather than charge neutrality. Okay, I see no more questions or hands raised. Uh, it's uh, after six o'clock, so I, I, that's a good sign. That means we um, had lots of questions, lots of discussion, and a, and a very interesting and educational talk. So um, thank you so much for doing this, uh, even despite not being able to be in Barcelona. I'll take you to the Sagrada Familia. So we'll keep that for next time. And yes, uh, all right. I wish everybody a very nice day or evening, depending on where you are or night. So thank That's you fine. very much. Yeah, we can unfortunately not do a digital uh, applause. That's still... Uh, That's not. something we need to fix, yeah. <laughs> I see, I noticed the participant number. How, how many did we have today? Um, uh, but this, oh, it was up to 260 or something like that. Okay, that's kind of typical at these events, right? Uh, it's uh, always in the hundreds. <laughs> it's... Uh, a bit more than a regular conference. Uh, yeah, which is which is very good. That we yeah, can yeah. chat to more people. All right. So yeah, talk to you some other time, hopefully, and yeah. see you soon, perhaps. Yeah. All we'll right. Out now. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you very much and I'll see you tomorrow in the next seminars. Bye bye.